good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming, especially on Sunday evening. We're going to do this event, like how I think it looks like. So I'm really glad to see your beautiful faces. Uh, so tonight's talk is on the tritium uh, by Father Samuel Hakeem, he's a vocations director for the Central Province of the Dominican Order. Uh, he went to Emory Riddle for his bachelor's in faith physics, actually, and then he uh, discerned into the order during his graduate studies, where, and then in the order, he got his master's in theology. So we're really grateful Father was able to come drive over here from Chicago today. And so, yeah, thanks, Father, for joining the talk tonight. Bridget, thanks for having me for a couple of days, actually. Excited to be here, looking forward to getting to know all of you and uh, giving a few talks. Why don't we begin with a prayer? And since we're talking about the Triduum, this is the sort of the opening prayer. We'll get to why sort of a little bit for Good Friday. And the Father and the Holy Spirit. Remember your mercies, O Lord. And with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal history. He lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. So I know it's a little bit early to be talking about the Triduum. This is the third Sunday in Lent, we're not even halfway there. But uh, it's one of my favorite, well, it is really my favorite liturgy. Uh, it is way one single liturgy. I think it's important that we dive into it. In fact, the rubrics, as you've seen a bit, they say that we're supposed to dive into it. It's the job of the priest to educate the laity on what it is that we're celebrating, the significance of it, um, and the intricacies of the good one as they unfold during the Holy Week. Uh, so we're doing that exactly here and now. Uh, this talk is not so much focused on the historical development of, although there will be parts that are that, that mention certain tidbits of history, but more about its practice in the contemporary form, modern writers. Um, but oftentimes, Novus Ordo gets sort of pushed aside as, as not as nice, not as dignified, not as beautiful. There's something to be said about the old mass uh, and its, its incredible beauty. Uh, but a well celebrated, well understood Novus Ordo celebration can be uh, extremely beautiful. As well. And if we don't do so for the Triduum, then what will we do for? If there's one thing worth making as beautiful as possible, it is the Triduum. So, diving in tonight, we're going to just sort of walk through the three main celebrations, as well as the liturgy of the hours during the Triduum, um, and how they sort of come together to form one liturgy over three days. Uh, so, I mean, that is sort of the first point, right? That the Triduum is a three-part drama that plays out in real time. The sacred time, Kairos, and the actual physical time, if you will, of our world, the Kronos, come together as we celebrate the Lord's passion. We sort of walk with Christ to the cross, into the death, uh, even to the descent to hell, um, and then eventually in time to the resurrection. So the timing matches the timing, if you will, of especially the synoptic gospel accounts. Uh, all the way down to Good Friday being recommended that it be celebrated at 3 p.m., the time when uh, the Lord dies on the cross. So at least, again, it depends on which account you're reading. In John, it's a little bit later. It's from the Son of the Lambs, but in the synoptics, it's around 3 p.m., the Lord dies. So sacred time and the time of today, the time of our world, come together as we celebrate these mysteries. Uh, <clears throat> as we know, there are three main celebrations. Right? It begins with the Mass of the Lord's Supper, Holy Thursday of the Lord's Supper, as it's called in the, uh, in the Missal itself. We have the celebration of the Passion of the Lord on Good Friday. And then Easter Vigil, really technically kind of beginning on Easter Sunday, uh, not so much on Saturday. That Saturday is a day of 
silence, liturgically speaking. Or if you work in the church, if you're a liturgist or a priest or some other minister, it's a day of hectic preparation. It comes down to it. Uh, but liturgically speaking, it's a day of silence. Uh, so yeah, I want to read to you a few of the opening rubrics for the season of the Triduum. Uh, it is its own separate season as well, you know, sandwiched between Lent and the season of Easter, which begins really Easter Sunday and goes for the next 50 days. So right off the bat, the sacred Triduum, the church solemnly celebrates the greatest mysteries of our redemption, keeping by means of special celebration the memorial of her Lord crucified, buried, and risen. The Paschal Fast should also be kept sacred. It is to be celebrated everywhere on the Friday of the Lord's Passion, and where appropriate, prolonged also through Holy Saturday as a way of coming where the Spirit will the joys of the resurrection. So again, this coming together, right, of the sacredness of the liturgy, the extreme solemnity that we're about to celebrate, as well as the temporal context of that fasting on Friday and if possible into Saturday as well. Now, I want to mention something. Two days of fasting straight can be a burden. I mean, it's fasting, right? It's supposed to be penitential. It's supposed to be a burden. However, fasting is only appropriate and it's only truthful uh, if it leads to growth in holiness, growth in grace. If you pass out from lack of meals for two days, you're not growing in holiness. So you know, the church gives us very specific rubrics on what a fast is. You know, one full meal and two smaller meals that don't equal together the size of one full meal. Uh, so you know, when we fast, we should be aware of the practical things as well. Um, moving on to the second rubric, for a fitting celebration of the sacred Triduum, a sufficient number of lay ministers is required who must be carefully instructed as to what they are to do. This is sort of an all play liturgy, right? The more the merrier, especially when it comes to having an army of servers. You uh, need tons and tons of lectures as well. Hopefully a well-trained choir who uh, will sing beautifully. Uh, instrumentalists of some sort, hopefully a good organ, if the church has a good organ. Um, but the more that we can put into these celebrations, the better. But it doesn't end there. The singing of the people, the ministers, and the priests celebrate has a special importance in the celebration of these days. For when texts are sung, they have their proper impact. Now, this was something that I loved about the new missal that came out back in 2011. Everything, just about everything in the missal is noted in both you know, written text, but in some form of chant notation. Uh, most missals have the sort of modern five bar staff chant, you have notes that, that look like music on the staff. Um, other missals might have it put in Gregorian. Um, but the, the fact that it's in here reminds us that this should be sung, right? We talk about singing the mass, especially during these days, it can be chanted or sung, it should be chanted or sung. Uh, I've had the opportunity to celebrate liturgies, not so much during the, the Triduum, but otherwise in a few Benedictine monasteries. I'm always impressed with how the monks celebrate their more solemn occasions. I was at the Feast of the Holy Trinity at Christ in the Desert Monastery, which is in New Mexico. Uh, they are Benedictine, they're OSB, but they're very close to being Trappists. They live a life very much apart from the world. In fact, their monastery is off in the desert, 13 miles down a single lane dirt road, which can become a bit treacherous, but you are really out there. Uh, but their liturgies, especially for these high solemnities, they do not speak a word. The entire liturgy is sung beginning to end, and it brings a magnificence to it. So again, with the Novus Ordo, you know, it's possible to make a Novus Ordo celebration incredibly rich and beautiful, and singing is a way to do it. So especially during these days, if singing can be done, it's good for it to be done. Um, now I should start, I should have started with this caveat. Everything I say tonight is going to be in the ideal. You know, we have to always adapt to what's available, what's possible. I have not met the priest here in the parish. I don't know what he does, so don't call and say, <laughs> Father Samuel Dominican said you have to do it this way. Um, <laughs> But you know, do what you can to to contribute to these celebrations. Uh, 
And then my favorite part, and the reason why we're here tonight, pastors should therefore not fail to explain to the Christian faithful as best they can the meaning and order of the celebrations and to prepare them for active and fruitful participation. So there's reasons for things like this. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen often enough in parishes. So diving into the liturgies themselves, Holy Thursday, Mass of the Lord's Supper. Uh, there are two you know, hinge moments, if you will, in the Mass. One of them is absolutely necessary. The other one is more optional, especially in the past year when we were in empty churches celebrating these offerings of empty cameras, or thank God if you lived in a religious house, you had a religious community there, uh, but the washing of the feet was omitted. But the washing of the feet and the institution of the Eucharist are the main points of focus for the Holy Thursday liturgy. Uh, for us as priests, it's a very significant night because we're celebrating the institution of the priesthood. And the two hinges of the priesthood, the service, especially the service of the body of Christ, and of course, the Eucharist. So the entrance antiphon for the entire liturgy, for the entire triduum, comes from Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life, and resurrection, through whom we are saved and delivered. So right off the bat, we're given a little bit of a sneak preview of what it is that we're doing. And the words here are important. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That by celebrating these liturgies in the way that we're celebrating, putting our all into them, and truly celebrating them as liturgies, we are glorying in that cross. These shouldn't be liturgies that feel overly penitential or burdensome. I say overly for a very specific reason, because there's a lot of penance that happens in this Good Friday liturgy. Uh, but, you know, from beginning to end, we celebrate the passion of our Lord, the Paschal Mysteries, and the glory in what they have. The other important thing is that even though we move into the sacred time, we follow in a somewhat real time the events of the passion of our Lord, we do so knowing the full story. That we're in the future, right? We know the entire story. Christ dies, and he rises again. We know that, that resurrection is our redemption as well, and offered to us as this gift of salvation. So with that in mind, it's impossible to divorce ourselves completely from what we already know, therefore, it's important to glory. Speaking of, we have for the first time, although we get it twice during Lent, I guess, we have a Gloria in this Mass. And not just any Gloria, it's encouraged that bells are rung during the Gloria. Now, liturgically speaking, bells have one specific reason, and this does go back to the old, right? Bells are a reminder to wake up, pay attention, right? It is during the important parts of the Mass that bells were rung, because in the old rite, uh, most often the Mass was not heard by the people. So it was kind of this, hey, by the way, pay attention, here it comes. Um, the bells in the Gloria during the Holy Thursday Mass of the Lord's Supper serve that same purpose. Wake up, here it comes. Um, now bells with music or chanting can be jarring. This is where a good liturgist comes in and picking bells that sound good with whatever <laughs> instrumentation goes on. Uh, don't always have that luxury though. Uh, I was once at the Norbertine Abbey up in Wisconsin for a liturgy and it was during Advent. So bells sort of fit and their organist there had a full repertoire, full set of hand bells. So he was able to pick bells that matched perfectly what it was he was playing based on key and everything else. Something like that would be wonderful. Most parishes do not have the resources to do so. Mm -hmm. order, so we often get the altar bells, which are tinny and clangy sometimes, and uh, but they still serve that purpose of waking us up to what's about to begin. So then it's mass as usual. I have two readings, a psalm in between, gospel, and then after the homily, the washing of the feet. Now, as I said, this is not absolutely necessary to have the washing of the feet. 
it's not, you know, it, it's still mass, right? Without it. Whereas like, if you say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna skip the institution of the Eucharist. Well, you no longer have mass at that point. That's a bad idea. This part is somewhat optional, but it's fitting that it's celebrated whenever possible. Um, so after the homily, where a pastoral reason suggested the washing of the feet follows. Now there are two different things that we can sort of commemorate in the washing of feet. The more traditional and preferred method is to have 12 people up front, 12 people that represent the community of the, of the church. Uh, so they should come from a, a broad range of people in the church, like some of the leaders, perhaps some of the catechists. Um, it's, it's, you could have children as well when they represent the, the body of Christ who are there. Um, but that number 12, of course, makes it sort of a reenactment of the Last Supper of all the apostles who would have been there at the first washing of the feet. And of course, the priest in the result of priest who going around and washing their feet. It's a reminder to the priest of the humility of service, that you know, we are priests for the sake of the people of God, for the sake of the church, and our, our ministry is one always of service. Uh, the other form, it's not my favorite, but of having multiple stations, if you will, around the church. And once your feet are washed, you wash the next person in line. There's something, you know, we don't want to just disregard everything, dismiss everything. There are some horrible ideas in liturgy, as we know, but not all of them are absolutely horrendous. Usually they come from a good support. And here it's the, you know, we talk about this as the mandatum, right? The, the mandate given, as I have done, so you must also do. Uh, so some form of that, uh, while perhaps not fully appropriate, is not unfitting to what it is that we celebrate. This idea that as has been done to me, I also do to another. Uh, but whatever form it takes, there is a washing of the um, One thing that I would say is completely inappropriate. I'm realizing I, I should have probably asked more about the celebration of the year, but I'm assuming the celebration <laughs> of the year is, is pretty darn good given what I've seen. Um, but I have seen in parishes a washing of the hands instead. And I asked why this happened. The answer was feet are gross. <laughs> now, keep in mind the whole point of this, the whole like significance of the washing of the feet was that feet are gross, right? And that Jesus does this is this huge sign of humility. Um, so it should be something that is jarring and, and you know, if it's not going to be washing of the feet, it's best to be left out altogether. And of course, during it, there is a chant or a song. Usually it's the words instantary of speaking through what happened um, at this washing of feet. The gospel for this night, by the way, is also the washing of feet. It's not the gospel of the institution narrative of the Eucharist, um, because we get that little one at the Eucharist. Um, so moving on, there's also a creed. And then we move into the liturgy of the Eucharist. Now this was something new to me <clears throat> when I sat down and read through these rubrics for the first time. At the beginning of the Liturgy of the Eucharist, there may be a procession of the faithful in which gifts for the poor may be presented with bread and wine. I'm not sure if this rubric is just from the U.S. Missal, if you will, or if this is a rubric from the, you know, from the church at large, uh, but it is fitting. And this is somewhere where that mandatum does play out in a better way than this sort of everyone might not the mosh to speak. That the gift of service, the gift of, of charity to the poor can play out in a procession of gifts. It's a reminder that when we bring the gifts to the altar, bread and wine, that we see in the body of Lord Christ, it's representative of our entire lives. That we bring ourselves and everything that we sacrifice to the altar and to God, which is then sanctified and returned to us as this gift of salvation. It's kind of a neat way of, of working it in there. And it's during the preparation of the gifts, the offertory, that the Ubi Caritas is supposed to be sung. So lots of different versions of Ubi Caritas, English and Latin, every different language, sometimes in mixes of language, but that's sort of where it belongs, linking the service of the Washington feet to the gift of the Washington feet. Um, and 
It's mass as usual for the most part, although there is a special Eucharistic prayer for Holy Thursday, only used on Holy Thursday, which again points to the meshing and together of the times. Um, so, yeah, I'll look at the exact points. There are a few of them. On the day before he was to suffer for our salvation and the salvation of all, that is, today, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and his eyes raised to heaven. Not a lot of so that is today is inserted in there. It's the only time that we get words inserted into the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, but again, it's this reminder of we've entered into this sacred time. Uh, so the Eucharistic prayer continues. Uh, the Roman canon Eucharistic prayer one should be used for this mass because it is, you know, it's the most significant, the most solemn of the Eucharistic prayers, and therefore uh, the most fitting to use for one of, if not the most solemn occasions. Um, after the reception of communion, we have the transfer of the Blessed Sacrament. So usually an altar of repose is set up somewhere else. How does it work here? Is it in, in the same sanctuary or is it like in a different room? Different room? Awesome. I like that because it makes the procession an actual procession instead of just sort of wrapping the church and, and into the side altar. Either one is, is fine. Uh, what shouldn't be done if there's going to be a procession, though, is that it's taken from the altar and returned back to the altar. Um, but after the prayer after communion, the priest and ministers go up, incense the, the ciborium. So it's not usually a monstrance, not supposed to be a monstrance, but rather a ciborium. And it's processed to an altar of repose, hopefully in another place. Uh, this is very easy to do in a religious house where we usually have some sort of other chapel or can sort of set up another altar of repose very beautifully. Um, it's much harder to do in a lot of parishes where uh, your options are like the disgusting basement or maybe some sort of like multi-purpose room. Uh, however, with a little bit of, of effort and, and work, uh, it can be done. Um, the other thing is, you know, during Lent, there's a rubric that there shouldn't be any flowers at the altar, except for maybe Litare Sunday. Ex and until this point, so keep in mind we're in a different season. So it is fitting and appropriate to have flowers at the altar, both at the main altar, you have not tons of flowers, not Easter mode yet, but to have some flowers, but then at the altar of repose as well. Um, in fact, if you go to uh, Italy, you'll often find these altar of reposes to be very lush and green, filled in with plants, because the time at the altar of repose represents the time with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So it's during the procession that the Pange Lingua is chanted, which always makes us Dominicans cheer a little bit. It was composed by St. Thomas Aquinas. It's a beautiful Eucharistic and one of many that he composed, or one of a few significant ones that he composed. Uh, it's rich in theology as well. So if you haven't really looked into the Pange Lingua or the, uh, the end of uh, benediction, we usually, or I guess the beginning of benediction, we usually see the Tanja Marigold, the final two verses of the Pange Lingua. Uh, they're filled with this rich Eucharistic theology, uh, but in this beautiful Latin poetry as well. So, I encourage you to, to spend some time praying before the Eucharist with the words of the Lingua before we get to Holy Thursday. Uh, so the Eucharist is placed in an open tabernacle on this altar of repose. The priests and the ministers, whoever it might be, usually a therapist and some candle bearers, genuflect after some time in silent adoration and leave in silence. So notice what's missing there. We have no Closing to the Mass. There is no ite misa est, no go in peace, because the liturgy is not over. It really shakes us up. You know, liturgy is routine, right? It's supposed to be the same thing over and over again, because we, as human beings, are creatures of habit, and tapping into these routines is important to our spiritual life as well. There's something strikingly different 
and that it doesn't end. Now, an altar of repose, as I said, kind of represents that time with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Dominican life and in certain other religious communities, there's a tradition. In fact, in Dominican life, it can replace nightmare, it replaces conflict, of reading the Last Supper discourses, or parts of the Last Supper discourses, so John 15 to 20, 21, uh, at the altar of repose. Um, and that replaces our, our nightmare. Um, but the Mass of the Lord's Supper throughout the church replaces evening prayer. So there is no Vespers if you go to the Mass, if you attend the Mass of the Lord's Supper. That might be different in certain uh, religious orders, perhaps the Benedictines, because this is sort of their thing, right? They exist to pray the liturgy of the hours and to celebrate the Mass. Uh, but for those of us who are celebrating the Mass of the Lord's Supper, it replaces evening prayer. And if Vespers is prayed, so for Earth, not Vespers, Compline is prayed, night prayed, it comes from Sunday. So even though this is Thursday, uh, during the Twitter so Thursday night and Friday night, Compline comes from Sunday. Uh, if you join us for Compline later, I, I'm going to talk through some of the neat Dominican things that we do for Lent. Hopefully, we'll be able to incorporate some of them into Compline. Uh, all of those stop, though, because we're no longer in Lent. We're now in a new season of the Triduum. So it's pretty much straightforward Compline as usual, with no extra embellishments. Uh, to tell a Dominican no extra embellishments at Compline is like taking away all of our toys. Because <laughs> for whatever reason, the Dominicans chose Compline as the thing we were going to mess with the most. Um, and, uh, so some very beautiful things inserted in. Uh, so no Salve Regina, uh, no hymn to St. Dominic either at the end of Compline. It's just psalm, canticle, and end of it. Uh, Friday, oh, an altar of repose Usually they stay until about midnight. There can be chants or music of some sort, but from midnight on, it should be another silence if people are still around. Again, outside of religious houses, there's not usually the tradition of staying around past midnight. Might be here. It sounds like there's a, a lot that goes on at night with adoration in these here parts. Uh, that's wonderful, but it is this, this beautiful time of silence. Personally speaking, I have this, this funny tradition that started as a started as Dominican of staying at the altar as long as possible, and inevitably I end up falling asleep. Uh, which again, like it's so fitting to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, falling asleep when Jesus says stay here, be watch. Uh, so it just it helps to dive into that that liturgical mode when we're celebrating this in real time. Moving on to Friday. Friday is the strangest period of liturgy in the entire liturgical year. It's very different, strikingly different. It's called in here the celebration of the Passion of the Lord. Again, that word celebration, and we use it for liturgies in general, right? But it is important to remind Paris, it reminds ourselves that we know the story here. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not mean we should just say, oh, well, we should celebrate, right? You know, we don't need to worry about the, the sorrow that the cross was. Uh, but we still know the entire story and have to read it in its context. Um, so the church always moves us forward into this place of hope. But we have no reason for despair in what Christ did, like the apostles might have had. We see that especially in Peter, right? Not total despair, because we have been with the Lord. There is this, this cause for what the heck have I done? We should ask ourselves that all the time, but we also know where our redemption lies. So the color for this celebration is red. Priest, and if there's a deacon, are in red vestments. Uh, but the altar is bare. The altar was stripped at the end of Holy Thursday and remains bare. There are candles at the ambo. But there are none at the altar. The priest and the ministers come in, bow to the altar, and then prostrate themselves way down on the ground. So, right off the bat, something different, right? It's a reminder that this is not normal. Now, 
because this is not a new liturgy, I like when I when I was celebrating this in the parish, I did what I could to make sure that this didn't feel like a new liturgy, which meant no pre-mass announcements, no welcome to blessed sacrament parish. Our opening hymn, well, there is no opening hymn, so there's no reason to you know <laughs> say anything. Uh, there's something very beautiful in starting about starting in silence and just having the ministers process it in silence prostrate themselves while everyone else kneels and then getting up and going directly into the opening prayer. So in fact, there's not even a let us pray at this point. The priest just stands up, goes to the chair, and begins the prayer that I open this lecture with. Moving through Friday, Friday is a really neat service. We get the a very, very long portion of the suffering servant psalm from Isaiah. As the first reading it tells the whole story in, in prophecy form of what Christ has done. Um, then we get the My God, My God, why have you forsaken me? Is the psalm and a passage from Hebrews as the, uh, as the second reading. And then always the Passion according to John. Now remember what I said about singing taking precedence during this time. The Dominicans have a tradition of chanting this passion, uh, when possible having three deacons do it, but if not three deacons, having at least a deacon or a priest and lay uh, chanters who are proficient in skill. Um, it's sort of an endurance test of chant. <laughs> it's a long thing. And it's also an endurance test for those who are, who are present for the liturgy as well, but very beautifully done. Uh, and then perhaps my favorite rubric in, in the entire missal. After the reading of the Lord's Passion, the priest gives a brief homily, and at its end, the faithful may be invited to spend a short time in prayer. The priest is supposed to give a brief homily on Friday. Again, if your priest did not give a brief one, don't worry. the rubric says, um, but I, just, I just think it's hilarious that you know, the church knows, okay, you're a human, you just heard you know, 15, 18, 20, if it's chanted 30 minutes or more. Uh, passion narrative. We don't need a super long holiday here. Uh, <laughs> and then we move into the solemn intercessions. So there are 10 different prayers. Uh, and it's the sort of Catholic calisthenics. There's the prayer, let us kneel, let us stand, a prayer read by the priest. The next intercession, let us kneel, let us stand, a prayer read by the priest. And hopefully chant it. Uh, so the intercessions start internal, if you will, and move further away from the Catholic Church itself. So for Holy Church is number one, the Pope is number two, for all orders and degrees of the faithful, so bishops, priests, deacons, the laity, um, for catechumens, so those who are about to enter the church, who should, by the way, be present at these celebrations. For the unity of Christians. So now we move beyond Catholicism into the body of Christianity, unity of Christians for the Jewish people. It's interesting to see in a liturgical celebration of prayer specifically for the people of Abraham, who are the Jewish people, but it is in here. And for those who do not believe in Christ, so other believers who may accept God but do not believe in Christ. And then for those who do not believe in God. So now we've prayed for just about everybody, right? I love the fact that after, for those who do not believe in God, we have for politicians. For those who don't <laughs> draw your own conclusions. Anyway, <laughs> um, it, it's funny that the juxtaposition between the two. Um, and then for those in tribulation. Um, for those in tribulation is sort of the catch all covers everything. So he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting travelers safety, pilgrims return, help to the sick and salvation of the dying, and everything else. Uh, however, even though there is this sort of and everything else prayer, uh, the conference of bishops or even the diocesan bishop can elect to add prayers to this. So last year, there was a petition sent out for an end to the pandemic. Uh, in the Diocese of Madison, there has been one for many years now uh, for an end to abortion. 
as well. Um, so bishops can add ones that are of grave need, and the Council of Bishops in a, in a particular location, so in the US, the Council of Bishops can add prayers uh, that they see as significant. So again, it's this interesting place of innovation. It's not sort of people doing what they want, but is a legitimate way of adding to the liturgy. Uh, then comes the adoration of the cross. Oh, I forgot to say that the cross should be covered if possible. Um, in fact, next week, during or two weeks, two weeks away, mm -hmm. the, the cross gets covered up. It's a reminder of we're moving into this sacred time where we no longer have this representation of what Christ has done, but we enter into that celebration. So if there is an altar cross um, that's not hanging you know, up in the sky in an unreachable place, uh, it should be covered with a, with a violet cloth. Um, then a cross is brought in. It can be, maybe should be, a, a cross with a corpus attached, but if it's a bare cross, that's fine as well. It does not have to be this gigantic thing, uh, but it should be sizable. It shouldn't be just like a tiny wall crucifix or you know, one off a rosary. You hold the wood of the cross, you know, where is it? Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing that can detract or distract from this significant moment is when the cross is so heavy that it takes multiple people, and it seems like every time they lift this cross, they're going to drop it. Uh, that takes away from the significance of this moment. Uh, so it should be planned very well. Uh, but the cross is either processed in, in the back, three times, the minister stops. If it is, if there's a beacon, it should be the beacon. The chants, behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. And the people reply, come, let us the Lord. So once in the back, once in the middle, once in the front. Um, if for space reasons or tradition reasons, so this was a tradition in Dominican life, the cross can be taken from the side, and instead of being processed in, can be covered with a cloth. And the right arm of the cross is uncovered, behold the wood of the cross, blah, blah, blah. The left arm of the cross is uncovered, behold the wood of the cross, and then the, the, the cover is dropped. Uh, that worked really well on a live stream mass this uh, last year, not mass, but the celebration of Lord's Passion last year. Uh, but there are different options here, depending on space and other considerations. Uh, and they both have a beautiful solemnity to them. And then at that point, the, the adoration of the cross or veneration of the cross begins. It starts with the priest, and then he ministers in the sanctuary, and then moves on. The priest removes his chasuble at this point, and also his shoes, according to the rubrics, if appropriate. Again, there's always this sort of if appropriate, if appropriate. Again, in my opinion, where more appropriate than during the triduum to go all out. Of course, removing shoes is a sign of humility, also a sign of, of holy ground. Right. See Moses being told by the burning bush to remove your shoes. Um, there's this practice in Islam as well, removing shoes before going into the place of prayer. Um, now obviously, we are not Muslims, we're not doing it for that reason, but there's the same significance of keeping our shoes moving into holy ground. It's also a sign of humility. And then I might be making this up, but it sounded good to me. And the priest removing the chasuble. We now are focused intently on the cross and Christ on the cross. The priest is acting in persona Christi as shown by the vestments that he wears. So removing the chasuble is a reminder that while I act in persona Christi, I am not Christ. And this here on the cross is, is quote unquote Christ. Because we obviously don't believe that the cross, the crucifix is present somehow becomes like transubstantiated into Christ. Uh, but what we are celebrating, the significance of what we are celebrating, uh, the cross becomes central. Uh, everyone else then comes forward. I don't know. In in the parish here, is it custom to take off shoes? Or is that something new? Uh, most of my celebrations are in the context of religious life. And in religious life, we also do the same thing because religious. Uh, but I, I haven't seen that in many Parishes. If you did it here and it's not the norm, it'd probably be really weird, um, unless you know there was a discussion beforehand and it was decided that the speed is right. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, kind of a neat thing again, holy ground and, and showing humility. 
Um, then after the adoration of the cross, there is a chant of the Pukes uh, Videlis during, during it. And the cross is then mounted. It should be somewhere prominent, usually it's in front of the altar somewhere, and candles adorn the cross. Uh, candles from the lectern, if they're movable, can be taken out of the cross that you end up having for and is there. And ministers go off to these decree the Saborium to wherever the tabernacle is. So there's no mass here, right? there's no consecration of the hosts, but rather the hosts that were consecrated the night before are consumed during this celebration of the liturgy. Again, it's weird, it's different. There's not music during this offertory, there's no even altar clock, there's just a a uh, pall that's laid out, not a pall, a corporal that's laid out, and the ciborium is placed on top. It's a reminder that something different is happening here. And then once the ciborium is there, the priest comes in and begins the art body. As usual, that's here's command form of it. But it's, again, it's, it's out of order. There's something missing here. And what's missing, ultimately, is Christ, because he is dying. In our, in our liturgical time. So we move into communion after that. Uh, very simply, again, I don't want to put down the practice of this place, but it's best if it's done in silence, too. And there is no chant and there is no antiphon during communion here. Then, there is a prayer after communion, as normal, and there's even a prayer over the people, sort of a blessing. There is no, may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and no going peace. Then the priests and ministers genuflect to the only thing other than the Eucharist that gets the genuflection on the right knee, of course, uh, and that's to the cross. So instead of just bowing to the altar, since there's no Eucharist in the tabernacle, the priest and the minister is genuflexed to the cross again as a sign of what Christ has done for us. Um, leave in silence, and that's that. Now, Holy Saturday gets one page in here, and it's a page of three rubrics, and that's it. On Holy Saturday, the church waits at the Lord's tomb in prayer and fasting, meditating on the passion and death and on, his and on his descent into hell and awaiting his resurrection. The church abstains from the sacrifice of the Mass. It's kind of an interesting word to use. Abstains from the sacrifice of the Mass with the sacred table, the altar left there, until after the solemn vigil, that is, the anticipation by night of the resurrection, and the time comes for Paschal joys, the abundance of which overflows the Days. So Saturday, we have this abstention from the sacrifice of the Mass. Holy Communion may only be given in the form of viatica. So if someone is dying on Holy Saturday, can receive communion, uh, but others should not receive Holy Communion on Saturday during the day. Uh, but where the Mass sort of stops, or the, or the, the liturgy in the church stops, the liturgy of the hours picks up. So the liturgy of the hours on Saturday becomes the focus. And in fact, it said talking about you know meditating on the okay, what was the line? Uh, meditating on his passion and death and on his descent into hell and awaiting his resurrection. So the office of readings, which is the longer readings that come at the first hour of the uh, of the liturgy of the hours, the second reading is an ancient homily on the descent of Christ. Dead. In my opinion, as a, a professional preacher, if you will, as a member of the Order of Preachers, it is the most excellent homily ever preached. We don't know who preached it. It's just sort of this ancient homily. I don't know much about its own history, uh, but it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, so if, uh, if you get a chance, you know, there are apps like iBravery and others, spend some time reading that reading. Saturday. Um, 
maybe it is in doing office of readings, even if not to just open up office of readings, go scroll all the way down to the second reading and read that reading. There's something beautiful about this day that while we abstain from the sacrifice of the past, while we abstain from the great celebrations, it's hard not to anticipate what's coming. Even that plays out in the liturgy of the hours as well. So the antiphon, especially for evening prayer on Saturday, are all sort of sneak previews of the resurrection. Uh, they build from the first psalm to the second psalm to the third psalm, and finally the canticle of Mary. We're already talking about the coming of Christ. We're already talking about his return, and most importantly, his triumph over sin and death. Um, so while it's this weird in-between silent day, the resurrection begins to creep in. Like I said, if you work in a parish, it's hard not to begin some form of celebration as you're pulling out Easter lilies and hanging gold and white fabrics and other beautiful things. However, the altar is still left bare. So in those preparations for the Easter vigil, the altar remains bare because it's just burning the liturgy itself. Now the Easter vigil, in some ways, is the mass in its most complete form. Um, I'm glad that we don't celebrate this every single Sunday, as beautiful as it would be. It would be absolutely exhausting, but it sort of lose its significance. So while I do wish that Sunday Masses were celebrated more reverently, I'm glad that we don't have a whole, well, actually, how wonderful would it be if we had a whole host of baptisms every single Sunday? Um, but it would take the, we started with the Easter fire instead of the um, But there's this sort of ritualistic passing of blessing from one thing to the next throughout the entire uh, liturgy, throughout the entire Easter vigil liturgy. Uh, by most ancient tradition, rubrics, this is the night of keeping vigil for the Lord, in which following the gospel admonition, the faithful carrying lighted lamps in their hands should be like those looking for the Lord when he returns, so that at his coming, he may find them awake and have them at, sit at his table. Image of the virgins with the lighted lamps, right? The ten virgins by wise and foolish. The wise ones are the ones that had lighted lamps. Well, we start this liturgy with the lighted lamps. We maybe not start it, but very early on, we have these candles. Uh, it must happen at night. The entire liturgy has to happen between sundown and sunrise. Uh, obviously, it isn't going to happen for whatever nine, ten hours that is, uh, but during that period of, of darkness outside is when this liturgy uh, is supposed to begin. But because it's a vigil, the vigils should be times of, of extend to, you know, extended prayer. Uh, we hear about prayer vigils, right? And prayer vigils are, are longer. Uh, the, the office of readings is also called vigils. It's the longest of the hours in the liturgy of the hours. Uh, so this should be somewhat lengthy, and it is, right? We have up to seven readings from the Old Testament, um, and we have other things which make this a longer celebration. Uh, so it starts outside, if weather permitting, of course, with the lighting of the Easter fire. When the Easter fire is lit, it's blessed by the priests. Um, in fact, another favorite rubric of mine, a blazing fire is, is prepared in a suitable place up in the church. So it shouldn't be just this little like brush fire flames. This mm -hmm. should be something that's visible, something that's significant. I had a good friend of mine in Blessed Sacrament Medicine who visited the Sisters of Mary Morningstar for the for the Criduum, and their Easter fire was like 20 feet tall. <laughs> um, now, <laughs> you run into a bit of a problem when it's that big, you have this giant wax candle that is not a big fan of heat and that you have to light off of this Easter fire. <laughs> so it creates certain problems, but it's nice to have at least a fire that, you know, people a little bit further away than the patient can feel the warmth. The other thing is vestments are not always fire friendly and they're hard to uh, maintain while doing the fire. Um, ideally, the coals for the charcoal, or for the, uh, the coals for the incense come from the fire as well. That's easy to do, right? You place the coals in the in the, the basket of the fire and let them light up while the fire lights. So we have 
the fire that's been blessed, and the blessed fire is passed to the Easter candle and into the thurible. Then, as the people join the procession into the church, their candles are lit from that blessed fire. And behold, not behold, the light of Christ, thanks be to God, the light of Christ, thanks be to God. So we're already celebrating that resurrection. You know, this is night, even though we're not fully there, it's begun to creep in in a very subtle way. Um, I think when we think of the resurrection, we often think of this big, significant moment, right? And in some of the Gospels, it is that way. But I love how in John's Gospel, it kind of unfolds in a very quiet manner. It starts with Mary Magdalene going to the tomb and not finding Jesus there. She runs back, tells the others. Peter and John have this little foot race. John runs faster, apparently, <laughs> needed to write that into his Gospel. Um, and they also don't <laughs> find Jesus there. And then Mary stays in the garden weeping. Jesus appears to her, but it's not like, ta-da, look, I did it. It appears to her in disguise. He kind of guides her through this and eventually comes to, and then even when he appears to his, his disciples, they don't fully grasp this. This takes time to, to understand, to unfold. And we have a two to three hour liturgy to help us unfold that in the entire season of Easter afterwards. Um, so candles have been lit. We have the exultant, the proclamation of praise of this night, of the night and of the candle. In all of the liturgical things that we have, this is one of the most ancient. It's a very, very ancient thing. Um, I love the, the richness of the new translation again, the, the retranslation, I guess we should call it, because there's nothing new about this. Uh, but it's very, very beautiful uh, in its language. So there's a short form, but in my opinion, short form, we can just uh, skip it and stick to the long one. <laughs> because yeah. anytime that uh, there's something short, there's something being left out. Um, so then we have the long liturgy of the word. Again, this is the part that makes this a vigil. So in this vigil, which is the rubric, the mother of all vigils, the nine readings are provided, namely seven from the Old Testament, the Epistle, and the Gospel, all of which should be read whenever this can be done, so that the character of the vigil, which demands extended periods of time, will be preserved. Um, the story, the, the, the readings, especially those from the Old Testament, tell salvation history, starting with creation, um, and Abraham, Isaac, uh, and then Jacob, and then moving on to Exodus and the parting of the Red Sea, of course, a big selfish at the moment, which is the God. Uh, on the New Jerusalem in Isaiah, on uh, salvation offered to all in Isaiah, so expanding from just the, the Jewish people to the entire world. Uh, but big in Isaiah, it's a big theme in Isaiah. Uh, and then wisdom, which comes to the reading of Luke, and the, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit from Ezekiel. That's the end of the Old Testament readings. And then another oddity after these Old Testament readings comes the Gloria. During the Gloria, at least in the US, it seems like the custom has been to turn the lights on then. Technically, in the rubric, it says that the lights should be turned on at the beginning of the liturgy of the Lord. Something neat in church language. A custom is something that has been done regularly for 30 years. And that has the sort of rule of custom in canon law. Now, we're not talking about canon law, we're talking about the liturgy here. But I think that this practice of turning on the lights of the glory has been going on for at least 30 years. So at this point, we'll just accept it as a custom and keep doing it as, as something very beautiful and very neat. During the Gloria, again, bells can be rung. My favorite experience of this right, was when I was, I think it was the year before I was a deacon, the parish that I would attend in St. Louis and help out at, I was uh, one of the altar servers, one of the acolytes for this Easter Vigil. And 
the priest had just repaired the bells and the bell tower. And because it was this fancy new England system, it had a remote. <laughs> and so the priest had this remote in his pocket. And after the closing prayer, and reading from Ezekiel, there was this period of silence. And just taps the button. At first, you hear like the swinging of the ropes, and the bells started pulling. After about three or four tolls, the glory of the game. It was this like really awesome, you know, dramatic effect, if you will, which again in liturgy is not totally inappropriate. I mean, liturgy is some part of drama. It's not completely drama. We have to be careful of you know from turning this into some sort of pantomime of the gospels. But it was this really beautiful, significant thing to add it, you know, the bell tolling is the beginning. And it wakes you up, wakes up the senses to what it is you're celebrating. The lights go on, candles are lit throughout the church at this point, and, uh, and mass continues, not so much as usual. Um, before the gospel, we have the typical acclamation, if you will, the, the big A word that we passed it from since the beginning of Lent at this point, um, and it should be much more solemn. And the verses of this gospel the, the pre gospel passage, if you will, comes from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is the big Easter psalm. It's the stone which the builders rejected as becoming the cornerstone. Uh, it's the word that Christ himself used. Uh, it's the word that we find in Paul as well, it's talking about the resurrection and, and also in Hebrews. And so it becomes the Easter psalm. Uh, we get it a lot during the season of Easter, and it begins here, not in where a psalm would be but rather as the verses of that gospel affirmation. Um, another short homily, hopefully a short homily. It doesn't say a short homily in here. It should say a short homily. It's a super long one. But it does say that the homily must be preached. Uh, this is a Sunday Mass. And the rubrics say that on Sunday Masses and Solemnity Masses, the homily must be preached. Uh, it becomes part of the actual liturgy. So it can't be skipped. And it should be directed toward those who are to be baptized if there are people there who are going to be baptized. Uh, if not, then it should just unfold the mystery of the resurrection. It's ideally, a little bit of both. And then we move into the baptismal liturgy. Um, so it's children and adults who are to be baptized. From what I understand, what I heard, that's a very, very common practice here at Hilton. Would that were so in every place? What a beautiful thing to, to get to celebrate some entrances into the church uh, year after year. Uh, the blessing of the water, again, a very evocative prayer, a very rich prayer, talking about water as this creation from God, sanctified the spirit, uh, you know, water which saved the children of Abraham and the sea, water which gives us life, water you know, used by John and Jordan, and baptizing, etc., etc. So it's more than just bless this water, use it. Then, how is that water blessed? By the candle. The Easter candle is dumped into the water. Obviously, the bottom of the Easter candle uh, is dumped into the water. So, blessing from fire, the candle, candle to the people, candle to the font. Uh, so there is this sort of physical passing of blessing. We don't completely believe that to be true in other things, although we still, I mean, blessed things that are touched to other things. We have third class bells, right? So, clothing of a saint, or even a piece of fabric that was touched to a saint's relics, itself becomes sanctified to some degree. Uh, but this is in a very significant way. It plays out as we continue the liturgy. So, after the baptisms and confirmations, if there are, well, if there are baptisms, there will be confirmations. Nations, unless you're just baptizing babies, um, we move on with the renewal of baptismal promises for everyone. So it's not just those to be baptized, it's reminded that all of us together uh, renew this promise, renew this covenant. I'd like to think this as the moment of uh, reconciliation with Peter, which is really representative of the reconciliation of all of the apostles, right? 
that we too celebrate this reconciliation with Christ and renewing our baptismal vows and by being sprinkled by the water. Uh, candles are relit at this point. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that uh, it's a bit of a strategic move on behalf of the priest to use the ashes building to see if you can extinguish the candles or Sprinkles. But, uh, <laughs> as for Julians, are way too much fun for for the movies, but we get them for fifty days at least. So, <laughs> them next, so good stuff. Um, then it's mass as usual. Uh, we have the celebration of the Eucharist. Uh, this too has inserts, so if the first Eucharistic prayer is used. Disorienting, just flipping to the Eucharistic uh, prayer. So there is celebrating the most sacred night of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious and virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed those of his house, blah, blah, blah. So pointing to again, we're celebrating that night. This is that night. And then right before the epiclesis, the lowering of the hands. Therefore, Lord, we pray. Uh, if, therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept the celebration of our service that of the whole family, which we make to you also for those who you have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting them forgiveness of all their sins, order our days in your peace, etc. etc. It moves on. So we pray for those who have just been baptized as well, directly in this liturgy, uh, and throughout the entire Easter offering, throughout the Easter following. So, again, there's some significance, some beauty to this that focuses on what we are doing here and now. Those who have just been baptized who will receive their first communion uh, should receive it first before everyone else, and if possible, if at all possible, under both forms of the body and the precious blood. Um, in fact, I would say, and the rubrics do say, that it's good for all of the people to receive both forms on this day because of its significance. And that's not always easy to do, and it's not, you know, it, it doesn't say that everyone must receive both, both forms, uh, but it's a good practice on this day because of the significance and solemnity of it. Uh, there's a solemn blessing, and then we bid go in peace. Finally, after three days, we give a go in peace before it goes forth, and that's ended with the double A word on it as well. Mm -hmm. So that is the entire Triduum in a nutshell. Um, I forgot to mention the points where the, the liturgies in the church replace the liturgy of the hours. Um, on Easter Vigil, the Easter Vigil replaces both the Office of Readings for Easter Sunday as well as Night Conference for Saturday night. Um, so the two come together as one. I mentioned at dinner uh, to you know, sort of previewing this talk that one thing that I love about the, the Novus Ordo celebration of this liturgy, of this Triduum, is that it restores that entrance into the real time. Uh, I don't want to knock the old right. As I said at the beginning, it is a very beautiful celebration of the liturgy. But at some point, the Easter vigil was moved to Saturday morning instead of being celebrated Saturday night. It would end at noon on Saturday morning, which kind of breaks that, that special time. Now, I think the reason for that is because of the fast, right? The priest had to fast from the people as well. Until they received the Eucharist. So this idea of doing something at night uh, was, was not really feasible. So I like the fact that it's been restored and it happens the night of Easter. Uh, in monastic settings, it usually begins around 3 a.m. So it's a true vigil. It ends just before sunrise. And usually they turn around and come to the back of the chapel and celebrate the massive Easter morning. Massive um, so, very beautiful celebration, and very full. And I hope.
hope that in some ways this has been informative, especially when you celebrate it this year and in the future, and you're more prepared for what comes to the time. I'm going to take some questions. Do you not have any questions from colleagues? So, you know, literature goes back as far as Christ. Great. When was the church, when, when did the apostles start celebrating the tribute? Or when did this become a very special time? You know, that is a good question. Um, much of what we have in, the, in how we celebrate the living today dates back to there are a couple different developments, moments of the idea of like, the liturgical time, the fullness of it. Third century would be one moment, sixth would be another. Um, and then more developments of the Golden Of course, the Council of Trent sort of codified these things as, as normal. Uh, but as I said, that, that uh, the, uh, the exultant, the hymns of the candle, the very ancient thing, I believe, is a third century thing. So there must have been some sort of celebration at least of that Easter night, and that the, the fire of these. Oh, yeah. Um, I've been told that the Church of the Sepulchre in Israel yeah. most people do special Easter vigil now, especially with the first candle. I don't know what specifics were about when you could do you know anything about that? I don't. Okay. I, it doesn't surprise me though, of course. Okay. I remember so. something about like they went to the tomb with the candle and there was either like the, there was like our tour guide wasn't actually Catholic, so oh. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know if like there was uh, more like more information. So I don't, I, 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 you know, as you're talking, I remember something about the candle either being brought into or out of the tomb. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's lit in the tomb, but it could be. Uh, so maybe they, instead of doing this big Easter fire outside, uh, they start with lighting the candle in the tomb, uh, which you know, that's it's a, it's an adaptation, but a very beautiful one for a very good reason. Mm -hmm. So. As possible. Uh, I do remember something about the candle either going into or coming out of the tube. As we're going through the three days, right? Like there's this, I mean, it, it makes sense that it happens once a year because of how intense it is, but how, how have you found ways, you know, here at Dominican to like, you probably would burn in front of us, but <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, how do you enter it? The holier you get, it should be too, the more, the more like sorrow you have at, at the sufferings of Christ. Mm -hmm. How, how can we practically grow in, in that sorrow that mm -hmm. we have? And yet at the same time, be able to turn around with that joy of the resurrection, like, what are ways that you found that we can use to grow in that sorrow during that video? So one thing that's helpful is how well this matches our time. Uh, the, the, the celebrations of the Holy Day match our, our time as well. However, being very busy college students, especially late in the spring semester, that time is not usually easy to, to block out. Mm -hmm. To have three straight days of of, of nothing uh, can be very difficult. But I'd encourage you to do what you can to almost treat this as a retreat. Mm -hmm. you know, you're probably not going anywhere for it, but if you can, you know, do as much homework as possible on a Thursday morning, afternoon, etc. Uh, obviously, don't skip classes on Friday if you have them to, to, to enter into this. But, you know, if, if you can skip the class, <laughs> consider it, but uh, I didn't tell you that. Um, I, I taught in college for a while, so I've never told my students that. You're not my students, so go for it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, treat it as a as a sacred time uh, does certainly help. Um, you know, as a Dominican, and especially as a student, I had the luxury of doing exactly that. You know, there was not much expected of us during that, except for my final year when I was trying to finish my thesis during that week, um, oh, yeah. the deadline that was coming up, which itself felt kind of penitential. Um, <laughs> but even so, like I was able to, to set some time aside, especially on Friday, uh, to really enter into that. The other thing, and this was recommended by a spiritual director, a 
the lean and mono ratio, if I remember correctly, is it fast from everything? You know, yes, we should fast from food, according to the precepts of the church, but fast from technology, fast even from reading anything but the scriptures. And that really makes Friday feel stark, feel penitential in a, in a, a fitting way, in a way that leads to the holiness. Um, I was very concerned when I graduated, got ordained, that life in a parish would not be the same. It wasn't the same, it never is the same. But because the liturgies are so time consuming, there's a way in which that same pattern is still flowing. Okay. Friday, generally I had nothing to do other than the celebration of the Passion of the Lord. You know, people weren't gonna be scheduling meetings or when the school was out, so I had to worry about that coming to the school and talking to the grade school kids. It became that same sort of pattern with a little bit of setup, of course, but even the setup can be can be told. It's a prayer for the Holy Spirit. The other thing for me, this is a little bit more particular, being a priest during and being the associate pastor, I always just kind of give credit because you you're doing the Friday, you're doing the Friday, which is fine. I, I love this service. Um, but what we believe about the church as being the body of Christ, that we are united to Christ our head, that our sufferings are his sufferings, and a much smaller way his sufferings are ours. Watching people come forward to venerate the cross, people who I got to know uh, both in a, in a public way and in an internal forum for spiritual direction, confessions or whatever, and knowing the burdens that these people carry to the cross, and watching them venerate the cross was extremely moving. Uh, so there are ways in which we can tap into that, right? To really see it, this veneration of the cross on Friday as a total self-emptying and a total embracing of what Christ has done for us. So fast from everything. Uh, what was number two? Whatever number two was. Mm -hmm. And unite your 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 what you have to uh, oh focus on uh, the story of Christ and what he has done for us, especially you know sort of through this and unite what it is that you have, whatever pain, whatever sorrow, whatever sufferings that you have, whether they be voluntary and penance or involuntary, and just what the grace that you take to bring those two things. That was a much different experience last year when there was nobody in the church. There was nobody in the church other than uh, you know, four super old Dominican brothers and, uh, and two other priests. Um, you know, the, the, the starkness was the lack of people there. The people that I knew who were. At home and suffering in the way that some who had family members who were sick or dying of their mothers who were dealing with the suffering of, of not being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions for Alan? Uh, I mean, this is what we can do that. This is why this is not going to be. Why aren't the Holy Spirit said to try it? Do you want to hear the snarky answer? <laughs> because we don't have time. Um, it's that's I mean, that is the snarky answer. Um, there's a way in which it's I wish it was. Um, and when I look at our Jewish brothers and sisters who will celebrate like Rosh Hashanah and other big holidays, and we'll take those days off. I wish that we as Catholics would do something similar. Just say, hey, this is sacred time. And in my church, this is time. Now, in some way we do, you know, to be fair. We get Easter off, right? We, we probably you guys get Easter Monday off at least, mm -hmm. and Christmas. Like you know, typically speaking, at least in the U.S., Christmas is a is a holiday. Um, but this should be the most significant part of the day. If, if Good Friday were to go off, I would even say we take Good Friday off instead of Easter Monday. But that is a much more Catholic view, um, and not as much of a general Christian Protestant view. Um, but the, there's a way in which all of this gets wrapped into Palm Sunday. And that's a later kind of 
Well, I don't know if it's later, but what it does is give everyone, since Palm Sunday is a holy day of obligation, everyone celebrates the passion on that day and then stops short of the resurrection, which is what celebrated. Uh, but I do, I, I agree with you. I wish that this could be, be seen as specific. Well, 